serenity. Uh, there's a place of safety. Uh, there's a place of sanctification when we have trusted Christ as our Savior. And I'm so grateful for that. Amen. We can lay our heads on our pillows. and We don't have to fret and worry like the rest of this world does about anything uh, that's going on around us. Thank God for that. Amen. Amen. Psalm 100 this morning. Uh, actually... Uh, was going another direction and I started reading this in my devotion time and sort of got hung up in Psalm 100 um, because it speaks so well to us uh, about Thanksgiving and most of you know that we're in that season and uh, we ought to be thankful all the time uh, continually but uh, uh, this is a great challenge to all of us this morning uh, when, it, when we speak of uh, praising the Lord. Psalm 100, if you found your places and you're able to stand, uh, just five verses, but uh, uh, mightily full of great truth. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people, and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving. And into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting. And his truth endureth to all generations. Thank you. You can be seated. Pray with me, Father. Thank you again for the infallible, inspired, and errant word of God. And I pray, Lord, now, Father, that uh, we've come to this place where you give me an assignment, Lord, to declare the whole counsel of the word of God, to preach truth. And I pray, Lord, that you would help me to do that, Lord, freely. I pray, Lord, right now that I would uh, decrease that you might increase. I pray, Lord, uh, right now that you would uh, use the Holy Spirit, Lord, uh, to... Uh, sharpen our minds and open our hearts to receive the word of God that we would respond to the word of God when it comes time speak to us individually speak to us collectively I pray in Jesus name amen if you want a real simple outline not the outline I'm going to use if you just want to jot something down on a note paper or in your margin of your Bible there's really three things that he discusses here the psalmist uh, this would probably be in any uh, arena of his life. We know that he spent a lot of time in the Judean hillside. We know that he was in the court as a leader. Uh, we know that he faced some great threats with Goliath and his own son Absalom. And uh, he d dealt with some things with Saul. And we c it could probably be any, any uh, facet of his life. But in this psalm, he comes to conclusion that all of us need to come to conclusion somewhere in our life concerning our walk and relationship with the Lord. First of all, in verse 1, he deals with how we approach God. Uh, in verse 3, uh, verse 1 and 2 actually, in verse 3, he deals with how we apprehend God. And then in verse 4 and 5, how we appreciate God. Uh, you can do your own study with that outline. Uh, but does it matter how we worship? Does it matter that we praise? Well, sure it does. If you go back all the way to the Old Testament, you'll find it was very important even how Adam and Eve worship. We know that they covered themselves as they, because they were naked. Uh, we know that somewhere along the way they began a sacrifice. And all through the Old Testament, you see that there was a blood sacrifice made. And we know that it was very crucial how the priest went in as he offered sacrifice on a yearly basis for the for the worshiper uh, he made that uh, ascend into the holy place the most holy place uh, to put blood on the mercy seat and if he didn't go in there if he went in there nonchalantly if he went in there with personal sin in his life uh, to confess the sins of others and pay that payment we know that uh, he could be struck dead it was a very serious thing to worship but as I listen to our young people talk about their experience in camp last week, I begin to reflect on some things that I've taught here and some things I brought out. Uh, does it matter that we worship? Does it matter how we worship? Does it matter who we worship? Well, sure it does. It's very distinct in the Bible. But one of the things that we've done in our generation, we've got to be very careful of. We have confused praise and worship. There's a difference. Nowhere do you see in the Scripture worship doing this. We don't see worship doing this. We don't see worship with smoke and fire and the whole building shaking. That's not worship. 
Worship everywhere you see is on your face or on your knees or pro- listen in a fallen lay a position of humbleness, a position of adoration, a position of humbling ourselves. That's worship. But then once we worship, then we can praise. But what we've got to be very careful of is that we don't bypass the worship and get right into the praise. Now, if we've, if we've been in the Word and we're walking with God and we prayed and we've got our hearts clean, you see, the only way we can raise holy hands is to have a clean heart. And the only way we can raise clean hands is to have a clean heart. So once we've cleaned out our heart, we have the freedom and the liberty to praise and to exalt God. So that's the biblical concept between worship and praise and you have to find that balance so David in this text comes to the place and he links this thing of thanksgiving with praise you you can't praise without being thankful and you can't be thankful without praise they complement one another uh, Dr. John Phillips that great author said only when we're done with our sins and ourselves can we truly worship as we ought to how true that is. We've got to rid ourselves of sin and self to give him all the glory and honor. And that's what the psalmist is doing. I want you to notice something in verse 1, verse 2, verse 3, verse 4. Uh, everywhere there's action verbs that are mentioned here when it comes to praise. When it comes to this thing of praising the Lord. Uh, we see he says make, uh, serve, come, know, enter, be and bless. All those were action words. It tells us, and, and they involve this thing of praise uh, to the Lord Jesus Christ. Actually, this psalm is really a prophetic psalm uh, that anticipates the day that Jesus uh, will uh, reign from sea to sea and shore to shore. Yet there's some valuable truths that we can apply uh, from this psalm to your life and my life. You see, ladies and gentlemen, God wants us, when it comes to worship and praise, God wants wants us, listen, he wants us to be, to be participators, not spectators. You can't live off of somebody else's praise and somebody else's worship. He wants us to be a, a participators. We, we, can't, we can't live off of the choir's praise and worship. We can't live off of the praise team's praise and worship. God wants us to have our own unique individual praise and worship for him in a personal, unique relationship and fellowship with Jesus Christ. And we need to understand that. You see, sadly, one of the traits of the life's days is unthankfulness. I'm reminded of 2 Timothy 3, verse 2. There's 20 traits, at least, that Paul mentions there in that text. He says that men shall be lovers of their own selves, unthankful, unholy. And he mentions 18 other traits or characteristics there to describe the end-time generation. And those two, two that are found within those uh, 20 traits are that men will be unthankful and men will be unholy. Let me just say, if there's ever a challenge for us to be thankful people, listen, it's in the day in which we live. We live in a, such an unthankful country. Folks, God has blessed us. He has blessed us economically. He's blessed us finan- listen, financially. He's blessed us in so many ways today. Uh, we can't even count them. Amen? He has blessed us. He's blessed many of you. You've got clothes on your back, the song we sang. You've got a roof over your head. You've got shoes on your feet. Listen, that speaks in volumes more for most of America. A lot of America uh, in many places are struggling. A lot of third world countries have nowhere near what we have today. And I don't say that to make you feel guilty. I'm just reminding you today that we have been blessed. Amen? And we are being blessed. Well, as we look at the different outline, as in this time of Thanksgiving, we uh, First of all, I want you to notice there's a call to enter into his presence. For, look what he says in verse 1 and 2. He says, make. Uh, first of all, uh, that, he says, make a joyful noise unto the Lord all you lands. As you think about that, look, this word make is an action word. Uh, he says, make, or make, that word make literally means, it means to shout ye unto Jehovah all the earth. In the original Hebrew text, that's literally what it says. It says, to shout you unto Jehovah all the earth. Let me just say, when he talks about making a joyful noise, he's not talking about a, a racket, okay? Now, he's not talking about somebody that can't carry a lick of tune. Uh, that, we've used that out of context. Uh, well, the Bible says just make a joyful noise. Where is just some folks, let's just be honest, they can't sing. Amen. 
I can't sing a lick. I, I'll be honest with you. We got some folks that can sing, but there's some folk. Listen, I, they just can't sing. Let's be honest. And they'd be better off if they didn't sing. Amen. Let's just be truthful about it. That's not what he's talking about here. He's talking about every one of us. We have the ability within us, with the vocal ability God's given us, which we are to shout with excitement over what God has done in our hearts and our lives. Amen. If you're saved today and on your way to heaven, there ought to be a little bit of shout in you this morning when it comes to the things of God. There ought to be an inward stir this morning. And when you enter into his presence, listen, there needs to be a shout. Shout of excitement. I know in our contemporary day, uh, listen, we, we moved away from some of that, and I realize some of that is uh, far-fetched today. And uh, you don't, I don't think every time you come to the church, you're going to be able to shout. When some places you go, that's all they do, shout. And there's no depth. But listen, there ought to be a balance of depth and, and inwardly and vocally. We're to shout with excitement. He says, make a joyful noise. Uh, who's it to? Not for everybody else. <laughs> To the Lord. Our worship ought to be to Him. Our praise is to Him. Listen, it's, it's about Him. It's not about us. We're to shout unto the Lord. We're to shout with excitement. One of the greatest thing, threats today I see across America and many of our churches, we've, we've got to find a balance. We, we've got it way over here or we've got it way down here. Uh, there needs to be a balance. There ought to be some shouting us, amen, knowing that what Jesus has done for us, calling that us, us out of darkness into his marvelous light, there ought to be a little bit of excitement about us going to heaven, a little bit of excitement about being saved, a little bit of excitement today about what God's done in our lives. That word make, it, it means to... It means to develop it's an action word you need to to, to develop so to develop some excitement in you based on what God's done for you somewhere in your life amen that's what he's saying I'm reminded of Psalm 40 verse 1 through verse 3 uh, if you remember what the psalmist said there uh, he says I waited patiently for the Lord and he inclined unto me and heard my cry he brought me up also out of a horrible pit out of the merry clay and set my feet upon a rock and established my goings. And he hath put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God. Many shall see it and fear and trust in the Lord. Thank God he's put a song in my heart. He's put a song on my lips this morning. Listen, and I'm excited and I've never got over what the Lord Jesus Christ has done in my heart and my life. Amen. And let me just say, when you do, you're in trouble. Uh, a call to enter in His presence. It involves a shout with excitement. Then we're to serve with enthusiasm. Look at verse 2. He said, serve the Lord with gladness. Serve the Lord with gladness. We're to serve with enthusiasm. I'm reminded of a couple of scriptures here. Paul wrote in several places reminding them, uh, the New Testament believer, of how we're to worship and how we're to uh, serve with enthusiasm. Uh, Ephesians, uh, excuse me, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 20. Jamie probably has them on the screen. He says, For you are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Stop and think for a moment. You are been, you are bought. You've been bought. You've been purchased by the precious blood of Jesus. As he was nailed to an old rugged cross, he died for your sins and he died for my sins. He paid the price of atonement that you owed and I owed a debt that we could not pay. He paid it for us. Therefore, we owe nothing. And because he's done that and he's paid the price for our sin, he says, therefore, glorify God in your body. That's all I have to glorify him with is the way that I live and the way that I function is to bring him glory and honor he said in your body and in your spirit which are God's in other words he says Let every, every part of your body and in your mind and your spirit worship him uh, serve with enthusiasm and then I'm reminded of uh, uh, Colossians chapter 3 verse 22 he says servants, and you can just put your name down if you're a Christian. Uh, you are a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. Obey in all things your masters according to the flesh. He's your master. Uh, one of the greatest things we fail to teach is the lordship of Jesus Christ, uh, I believe, in our church age. He says uh, he, your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. 
And whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men, knowing that of the Lord you shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. Folks, we need to be reminded in our day, we serve the Lord Jesus Christ, and we do what we do for Him and for His sake, and we ought to do it with enthusiasm. Amen? Stop and think for just a moment. As you think about worship and looking at the Old Testament pattern, the Old Testament worshiper, he, they couldn't worship but once a year. They had to go then. They had to go through the high priest, and they would bring that sacrifice of that, uh, the blood of that goat or lamb or whatever it was, and they would bring it to the priest, and he would take it, and he would go through the process of worship, and then ultimately he would end up in the mercy seat, and he would go into the Holy of Holies, and he would take that blood that was brought by that worshiper, and that worshiper had to come every single year and offer that sacrifice and but he had to go through that priest thank God that's all been removed hey Jesus was our high priest and it's through Jesus that we have the opportunity it's through Jesus that every one of us on an individual basis no matter how old we are listen no matter how old or how young or no, what nationality or race we are we can come boldly to the throne of grace because of what he's done in our hearts and lives amen they can only come to, the Hebrews could only come to their designated court. And when you move to the Old Testament, the Gentile, listen, and the women had their own court. There was only specified places they could only go so far. They couldn't go into the whole. But listen, that veil and that curtain was torn down at Calvary when Jesus overcome death, hell, and the grave. Listen, on Calvary, he defeated the law and he overcome the law. And all that was removed. And now we have access by his grace. Amen. But look what he says. Serve the Lord, notice he says, with gladness. Serve the Lord with gladness. Uh, that word gladness it means with mirth. Uh, it means with laughter. It means to have a, it actually in the Hebrew text, it literally portrays and gives a picture to have a big old grin. Amen. You ever seen somebody, well, I like to watch these kids sometime when they're coming up here to give. When they're coming there and they're giving and putting this bucket. And I know they're giving their mom and daddy's money. Uh, but anyhow, they do it with a big old grin. I like to watch them. You ought to see their face. I ought to video it sometimes. But think about Christmas and think about getting ready. Some of you are going to eat together. And you're going to see people you had not seen in a while. And isn't it great just to see their response and they want to hug you and embrace you because they've been to college or they've been maybe in another, another state or somewhere or whatever and you had not seen them a long time. And you begin to see those children and grandchildren, relatives, or friends, whatever it is that's coming to your Thanksgiving and you see them for the holidays for the first time in a long time and it just puts a big old grin on your face, doesn't it? Now, I know there are some folks, let's be honest, you don't grin when you see them, Okay. We're talking about spiritual things, okay? But that's what he's describing here. He says, serve the Lord with gladness. You see, there's nothing more insulting than to see a person that's serving the Lord with a frown on his face or a frown on her face with discouragement and defeat and disgust. Just getting by waiting till Jesus comes. And I'll be honest with you, I've been there, whether you believe it or not. We all have. But there's a challenge here this morning to don't stay there. There's a challenge to get out of that rut this morning. You see, the picture here, you see, only this the acting priest can enter the holy place and enjoy the presence of God. But thank God, folks, there ought to be enthusiasm on our face because Calvary changed all that. If we've made a trip to Calvary, and we well, listen, if we, we have access now, uh, we, have an, listen, we have an open opportunity, an invitation to the throne room of God every day, every moment of our lives. Folks, that's something to be enthused about. You know why? Because I need it quite often. And I can come boldly to the throne of grace. And then thirdly, he says in verse 2, come with the Lord, come to, serve the Lord with gladness, come before his presence. There's that word action. The action word come. Come before his presence with singing. With singing. Sing with excitement. Singing. Uh, that word singing is a, it means a ringing out cry. You know, I go different places and you go different places. And uh, you, you watch people today in, in, the, in the secular entertainment world. Listen, they get so excited and a lot of them aren't even saved. They don't have anything to even be excited about. Uh, unless it's another gold record or another, on top of, a list on top of the charts. But folks, I, I see a world that 
uh, of entertainers and uh, we see all around us the excitement of so many different things uh, as we listen to the performances and folks let me just remind you uh, we ought to get excited about the things of God uh, I go to different sporting events and watch the grandchildren and I love sports like everybody else does and every now and then I get excited when my grandkid scores a goal or hits a, hits a shot or, or whatever makes a, a goal or whatever it may be I get excited I'll be honest with you but just stop and think about it. and I've had to ask myself a few times sitting on the bleachers or sitting on the sideline what if we got that much excited about what God's done for us what he's doing for us and what he's going to do for us amen what if we got that excited I, I'm, I'm excited about the goodness of God this morning I'm excited this morning folks about being saved amen don't let the world rob you sing with excitement is what he's saying serve the Lord with gladness come before his presence with singing sing with excitement amen some of us sing country music and all the other stuff with more excitement than we do songs about Jesus. I get excited. I used to get excited about Conway Twitty and Loretta Lynn and Merle Haggard and, and every now and then I get, every now and then I wander off and I might listen to some of that if it's decent. And you're not going to go to hell if you listen to some of that, okay? But you've got to pick and choose what you listen to. And by the way, there's some Christian music that's not Christian. It's not biblical. Well, I'll get off from that. That's a rabbit, okay? But what I'm saying is sing with excitement, amen? Sing with excitement. And then look at the third, second thing. There's a challenge here. There's a challenge here to recognize his presence. Look at verse 3. He says, know ye that the Lord, he is God. We're in a de debate today of who God is, <laughs> Uh, we, we, who, who's God? Well, there's only one God. He's the true and the living God. He is Jehovah. He is Elohim. And he has so many Jehovahistic titles all the way through the Old Testament and the New Testament. But know ye the Lord, he is God. The greatest thing you to do, first of all, in this challenge to recognize his presence, there's a word about his person. He uses the title, listen, he is God. Jehovah, he is Elohim. It's what the scripture literally says. And let, let me just say this. Unless we've learn that he is the only true of the living God all other truth will be out of balance in our lives don't miss that David had learned that he is God he's God and it is he that made us look what he goes on he's made us and not we ourselves we're his people and the sheep of his pastor so he says three things here there's a word about his person there's a word about his power he hath made us he made us thank God he's made us we're all recipients of his goodness and kindness. He's made us who we are. A word about his power and a word about his provision. It says that in the text that and the sheep of his pasture. Wow. A great play on words here, a portrait. In other words, his responsibility as our shepherd is to lead us, to guide us, to protect us, and to provide for us. That little word no is such a powerful word. That little word, it means to make a distinction. It means to make a distinction. He is either God in your life or he's not God. Don't miss what I'm going to say right here. You can't say he's your God and live any way you want to. You can't say he's your God and do anything you want to. You can't say he's your God and not follow the pattern that you have of the word of God for your life. There's a clash that's going to take place. And if it doesn't bother you and it doesn't convict you, there's something wrong in your relationship and your fellowship with God. I'm slicing it clean. This bottom line. But a challenge to recognize His presence. The question is, do you recognize His presence in your life? Is He a daily part of your life? Or is He just a Sunday activity God? Is He just a call on God when I need a God? A God of in my trouble? In my stress, my difficulty. You see, David's making some valuable truths here. Look at the third thing I want to show us in third point, verse 4 and verse 5. There's a command to express his, his praises. Notice it. He says, enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and his truth endureth to all generations. Really, a couple things he says here in this command. Notice it says in this text, enter into his gates. 
Don't miss that. Underline that. His gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. His, his, his. He's saying something about our praise here. It's his praise. It's not our praise. It's his praise. And we need to realize that. First of all, he says really three things about praise here. His praise. Uh, our, listen, his praise and our praise, it ought to be visible. That's what he says, first of all. Enter into his gates. You know, gates were used and still used. Gates were are, are used in that time for protection, uh, they put, to put a wall for the enemy not to get into. Uh, you, you see even uh, walls or gates uh, in, the, in New Jerusalem. Uh, you see gates today that will either keep you out or keep you in, one of the two. And you've got to decide which one applies. So as he looks to these, he says our, his, our praise ought to be visible. Listen, our praise is not to be seen for show, but to be seen sincerely. Uh, I love Psalm 34 because it speaks there of the sincere praise of the, of the saint of God, the worshiper. You see, what does this praise involve if it's visible? Well, first of all, if, if you look at the text, it really has three different levels. Uh, first of all, in Psalm 47 verse 1, uh, it involves clapping. Psalm 47, uh, verse 1, involves clapping. He talks about clapping our hands uh, to the Lord. Uh, we ought to clap. Uh, it's okay to clap, and we've got some that teach that you shouldn't clap. Well, if it's in the, it says it in the Scripture, we ought to clap. Oh, clap your hands, all you people. Shout unto the Lord with the voice of, of the triumph. He's worthy of a clap. Amen? We ought to clap and give a hand clap to God every now and then. Uh, he says, oh, clap your hands, all you people. Shout unto the Lord with the voice of triumph. Uh, it involves clapping. It involves lifting up hands. And Psalm 63, uh, Psalm, the David, psalmist said, I will bless you while I live. My lips shall praise you. You better praise him while you're alive. Amen. Uh, you, you're not going to do it when you're dead. You can't do it. Uh, and you need to seize the opportunity. That's what the psalmist is saying in Psalm 63, verse 4. It involves lifting the hands. Uh, lifting the hands. It involves clapping. It also it involves dancing. Second Samuel chapter 6, verse 14 that says David dance before the Lord now let me just stop right there David wasn't line dancing okay uh, I don't think David was doing the, the jitterbug or the twist okay uh, I believe David was dancing in joy he was dancing with joy and enthusiasm and I've seen a few folks just get excited about God and, and just do a, a little two step or a dance they get decided for the Lord that, that, that's biblical okay uh, but I don't think that it's you got to be very careful of the charismatic stuff involved in that. There have been, there's been some times I wanted to dance, but I can't dance. I'll be honest with you. I've slowed down to my wife, and I don't see nothing wrong with that. Just be sure it's your wife. Amen? <laughs> but he's talking about worship. He's talking about praise. There have been a few times in my life I just got so excited. I just, I just probably danced and didn't even know it. I danced inside. I think that may be what he's talking about, too. There's probably an application there, in, inwardly and outwardly. It involves our praise should be visible. But look, he says our praise ought to be vocal. He says in that same text, enter in his courts with praise and be thankful in him and, and bless his name. Uh, it ought to be vocal. If there's ever been a time we ought to be vocal about praising the Lord and what he's done for us, we ought to do it every day, but Thanksgiving it ought to be even more special. We ought to speak up and speak out about what God's done in and through our hearts and lives. And we ought to speak up and speak out about what, how God's been good to us. I just go on record to speak out today and say God's been good to this old boy. God's been good to my, our family. God's been good to us. He's been good to this church. Amen. He's still being good to this church. He's been good to you. Amen. Our praise should be vocal. And then our praise thirdly, it should be voluntary. Voluntary. Notice what he says. Be thankful and bless his name. For the Lord is good. For his mercy is everlasting and his truth endureth to all generations. Our praise should be voluntary. Nobody ought to have to make us to praise the Lord. Why? He tells us right here in the text. Number one, we've experienced his goodness. <laughs> we've experienced his goodness. God's been good to us. God's been good to me. He's been good to you. Shame on us if we don't praise him. Amen. 
we have experienced His goodness. Number two, we've experienced His grace. You see, I can't even approach God without His grace. For by grace are you saved through faith. He says, not, not that of yourselves, lest any man should boast. There, there's not a thing we can do that would please Him. Listen, it starts with grace. Listen, God extended His grace and His mercy on His Son, Jesus Christ, to cover our sins. We've experienced His grace. And then thirdly, we have His, or we have His experience guarantee. He says, his mercy is everlasting, His truth endure to all generations. You know, normally we think about gates, and gates are usually used to keep others out, especially enemies. But you see, we no longer are kept out, ladies and gentlemen, because of His goodness, because of His grace. We have continual guaranteed access into the presence of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Anytime and anywhere we have access and opportunity to be with our Lord. Amen. Man, that's awesome. That's awesome. That's the benefits of being a believer, a saint of God, a Christian. Maybe this morning you want to clap your hands. Maybe when you want to raise your hands, guess what? We ought to do something. Amen. Why? Because of what he's done in through our hearts and lives. Maybe you just want to shout a big amen this morning. Or maybe you just want to every now and then just give him a big old hallelujah. Whatever it may be, whatever he stirs in you, you need to do in your participation of praise. But let me remind you, don't miss that. Don't forget the worship. Humble ourselves before him. And he said he'll exalt us. Let me... Stop in conclusion to say this morning, as I think about what the psalmist is writing here, let me remind you of one thing that the psalmist wants us to key in on. Praise is not about what God can do for you. Well, I've been over at that church, and I just don't get anything out of their services. Did you put anything into it? Hello? I didn't get anything out of that preacher's message. Did you pray for him? Did you open your Bible? Did you follow along? Praise is not about what God can do for you. The praise is what, what you can do to honor him. That's praise. Amen? You can clap your hands. You can shout Amen. Never, if you want to shuffle your feet, that'll be all right, all right? Just do it within the Spirit, all right? But we ought to do something, amen? We ought to do something. That's the three challenges we have from this text. We want to praise God because of His goodness, because of His grace, and because we have at guaranteed access into His presence anytime and anywhere that we want to and need to, amen? Folks, what a privilege. What a privilege. Let, just anybody can't do that. You see, you have to be saved by grace through faith to be able to do that freely. You may be here this morning, you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior. You see, let me remind you, if you've never heard, listen, the gospels, the, the good news is that God sent His Son to this world, and He went to a cross, and He was nailed there. And the Bible says that he died on that cross to pay the sin debt of the whole world. The Bible says he was buried in an empty tomb. And on the third day, he arose from the grave. He manifested himself and gave many infallible proofs. And one day he ascended into heaven. And he told those disciples, stand there looking. He said, he said why are you standing here gazing? He said, I will go, but I will come again. And I'll receive you into myself. He made a promise that all those who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Let me just say, ladies and gentlemen, biblically, that's the only way a man, woman, boy, or girl can be a Christian is to trust by faith in your heart that Jesus died for you. He died for you, and he did all that for you so you might go to heaven. And then all you have to do is simply confess that you're a sinner and believe he did that for you to cover your sin debt and ask him into your heart and life. And that's how you become a new creature in Christ Jesus. 
not very confusing. But we live in a generation that's added this to it and added that to it and took away this and added what they wanted over here and added and took away what they wanted over here. That's just simply what the Bible says. I'm not talking about Baptist. I'm not, I'm not talking about anything. I'm talking about what the Bible says. And that's all that counts is what the Bible says. Have you been saved? Can you worship him in spirit and truth? But has that worship spilled over into praise? Maybe you need this morning, during this invitation, to come this morning and say, Pastor, I need to accept Christ as my Savior. Maybe you're here this morning. Maybe you're already a Christian. Maybe you just need to slip out where you're at and come and get on this altar. Say, Lord, I just want to worship you this morning. I want to worship you. I want to give you glory and honor and praise for what you've done in my heart and my life somewhere along the way. Lord, I want to thank you for a good husband, a good wife. Lord, I want to thank you for a, a great family. Lord, I want to thank you for uh, fellow believers. Lord, I want to thank you for my freedom. I want to thank you for whatever. When's the last time you just got on the altar and said, thank you? Thank you for your blessings, Lord, on me. You see, it doesn't matter what anybody else does. You see, worship is individual. And then worship moves collectively. What do you need to do today to worship? I'm going to have Danny to come this morning. We're going to stand to our feet with our heads bowed and eyes closed for just a moment. I'm going to pray. And then we're going to extend the invitation. There's a challenge to recognize his presence today in your heart and life. There's a call to enter his presence this morning. And, and there's a command to express his praises. What do you need to do today to worship or to praise him this morning? Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the truths that we find here uh, in this Psalm of David. And Lord, I pray that we would apply this message to our hearts and lives individually and collectively this morning. Lord, you know every heart, you know every life that's here today. And I pray that we would yield to the still small voice of God to do what you'd have us do during this invitation. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.